I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. You know, someone asked a great question. What is this early voltage? Well, that answer is easy. It's that voltage that arrives before any of the other voltages. <laughs> well, not really. So why did this come up? Because I mentioned it in one or more of the BJT circuit analysis videos. The whole purpose of this video is to give a rather rudimentary understanding of what it is and why it exists. Now, I say rudimentary because the deeper you dig into it, the more complicated the subject gets. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, the treatment of this subject begins with what is called the early effect. To achieve a better understanding of the early voltage, we first have to get a very basic understanding of the early effect, otherwise known as base width modulation. The early effect was first discovered by James M. Early. This effect is closely coupled with the way a bipolar junction transistor, or BJT, does what it does. If you are unfamiliar with how a bipolar junction transistor works, I invite you to view my video on the subject. There's a link up in the corner and down in the description for your convenience. I'm going to proceed with the assumption that you have a basic understanding of how the BJT does what it does. With that assumption, remember that the bipolar junction transistor is a current operated device. Current is the input and current is the output. Voltage only affects the operation of the BJT in so much as it affects the current associated with the device. We also have to be sure to remind ourselves that in the normal linear region of operation, the base emitter junction is forward biased and the base collector junction is reverse biased. As such, there is a space charge region around each of these junctions. These space charge regions do not allow for recombination of current carriers. As the current carriers cross the base emitter junction, some percentage of them recombine in the base material, but only in the region not affected by the space charge region at each junction. As the collector emitter voltage increases, the base collector reverse bias also increases. This then widens the space charge region around the base collector junction. This pushes the space charge region further into the base, narrowing the base material where the recombination occurs. With less base material available for current carrier recombination, more current carriers are available to cross the base collector junction and collector current increases accordingly. Thus, while we hold the base current the same, the actual collector current increases as we increase the collector emitter voltage. This is why the transistor curves, as seen when using a transistor curve tracer, have a slight positive slope to them in the linear active region. Well, now that we know why the VCE IC curves have a slight positive slope in the linear active region, we can proceed to see what this has to do with the early voltage. Well, now we're going to be diving into a bit of weirdness, which is the standard explanation of where this early voltage comes from. And none of the explanations that I have investigated has anyone said something like, this early voltage is the voltage at which this particular phenomenon occurs. All of them say the same thing. This is how we explain it. So, I'm just going to explain it the same way they do. To do this, we have to take a look at a family of transistor curves. Here we have a representative family of transistor curves as you would see on a curve tracer. The horizontal axis is the collector emitter voltage. 
The vertical axis is the collector current. Each line on the graph represents a specific fixed base current. The nonlinear portion of the graph is the initial portion where the collector base junction would be anything other than reverse biased. We then come to what is referred to as the linear or active operating region. If this transistor was perfectly linear, then these lines would be perfectly flat. But they're not. And this is because of the early effect that we already talked about. Now, let's expand our x-axis way out to the left, well into the negative numbers. We carefully take a ruler, lay it on the active portion of the transistor curve, and then draw a line out and into the collector emitter voltage negative region until the line crosses the x-axis where the collector current is equal to zero. Let's repeat this process for each of the lines of the transistor curves. Notice that they all cross the x-axis at the same spot. In the case of this artificially manufactured example transistor curves, they all cross at minus 100 volts. If we take the negative sign off of this value, we get the early voltage of 100 volts. Now, again, no one tells us what this magic voltage actually does, but it does play a role in the circuit analysis. More a bit on this later. Now, let's go from the ideal theoretical world into the real world of real transistors randomly chosen from my collection of 2N3904 transistors. Oops. In the real world, it doesn't exactly look like what their explanation tells us it should look like. In fact, it's not even close. I used my transistor curve tracer to grab data and then drew lines back to the x-axis using the same slope as the active portion of each of the transistor curves. The actual values of the early voltage varied widely depending upon the base current. True, the average value still worked out to be pretty close to 100, but this was not the case with a number of other randomly chosen transistors from the same bin of 2N3904s. What I did notice was that the lower the quiescent base current, the flatter the curve, and the more linear the transistor's response. It also means that the early voltage gets higher and higher, and that the output impedance of the transistor itself is higher and higher. More on this a bit later. In my other videos, I have said that we should use a value of 100 volts for the early voltage when doing circuit analysis. How did I arrive at using that value? Well, admittedly, I took in faith what I was told in engineering school, and as I have also seen in some engineering texts as being a good starting place. As you've seen, the reality is the actual early voltage varies widely with base current and with individual transistors, even of the same type and manufacturer's part number. And I've never seen either a value specified in a table or shown in any graph on any data sheet for any transistor which would give me the early voltage for a given device or operating condition. According to my engineering texts, the actual value can be anything from 15 to 350. So, you might ask, why do I even care about the early voltage? Well, the only place that the early voltage actually shows up in basic transistor circuit analysis is with the output impedance of the transistor itself. The standard equation for this is the output impedance of the transistor is equal to the early voltage, VA, divided by the quiescent collector current, ICQ. So let's take a look at this representative amplifier circuit. You can see the emitter resistor, the collector resistor, the load resistor, 
and the output resistance of the transistor itself. When calculating the voltage gain of this circuit, we have to first calculate the value of the parallel combination of the collector resistor, the load resistor, and the output resistance of the transistor itself, or RO. The approximate voltage gain is going to be equal to the value of this parallel combination divided by the value of the unbypassed emitter resistor. So, why don't we see this in a lot of these calculations? Let's consider a simple example using our real-life 2N3904 transistor that we saw the curves for earlier. So let's say we're on the base current equals 14.8 microamp trace at a quiescent collector emitter voltage of 5.25 volts the quiescent collector current is 1.7 milliamps. Now the early voltage for the quiescent base current equaling 14.8 microamps follows back to minus 110.53 volts. So what is R sub O? Well, R sub O is equal to the early voltage, 110.53 volts, divided by the quiescent collector current of 1.7 milliamps, which comes out to be 65 k ohms. With a collector current of 1.7 milliamps and a voltage drop of, well, let's say, 6 volts across the collector resistor, the collector resistor would be on the order of around 3.5 k ohms. Putting this in parallel with the input resistance of the following stage, we could be looking at an effective collector resistor of oh, about 3 k ohms or so. The addition of a 65 k ohm value of RO in parallel with this doesn't make a whole lot of difference in the resulting value. Thus, in the circuit analysis world, it is often, well, just ignored for simplicity. But suppose you want to try to calculate a value for the early voltage given the operating conditions of the transistor. Well, to that end, someone asked for an equation to calculate the early voltage. Well, here is an equation given in the textbooks for collector current, which includes the early voltage. Isn't it a lovely thing? IS is the reverse saturation current. VBE is the base emitter voltage. VT is the thermal voltage, or 0.026 volts at 25 degrees C. VCE is the collector emitter voltage. And VA is the early voltage. So I rearranged this to give us an equation for the early voltage, or VA. And I get, well, this equally lovely equation. Now, we can measure, calculate, or find values for most things in this equation. And while this is true, the problem here is that I have yet to see the reverse saturation current in a data sheet. Being that this plays a pivotal role in this equation, well, again, we're kind of stuck. In the end, we drop back to our rule of thumb value suggested in my engineering school days. We use the early voltage equal to 100 as a general estimate in our calculations. So there you go, the early voltage in all of its glory. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.